Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn. And I'm Christina. Bring on the rock puns. <laughs> See some like already. The, yeah, I love the granite one already. Um, we are part of the Nightlife team at Cal Academy in San Francisco. Uh, for those of you who are new, Nightlife is our weekly Thursday night events where we mix some science with cocktails, live music, and more. Night School is our at-home virtual version where Christina and I bring you a new theme every week. Um, and we invite some really cool people to share what they're working on related to the theme. Uh, today, we're talking about geology and society, and more specifically, how it affects us or can affect our lives. And the really cool people we have today um, are geologist and volcanologist, Devisha James, who's joining us from Dominica to talk about the island's geoheritage, who the Maroons were, and how our environment can shape a place's history and culture. Uh, next cool person um, answering the question of why mangrove estuaries are so important and how human activities are impacting them is Dr. Hendrada Ali, professor of geosciences at Fort Hayes State University. And finally, something very near to those of us, um, especially in California, Dr. Justin Rubenstein of the US Geological Survey talks about earthquakes, um, and why it's likely that we'll feel more of them in the coming years due to growing population and energy needs. So great night tonight. Thanks for being here from all over. And as always, tonight's program is live. So say hi, uh, let us know where you're watching from. Um, we always like to see if it's your first time or if you're a night school regular. So let us know in the chat. Uh, we'll have Q and A's after everyone's talk. So get your questions in the chat or comment box. Um, and with that, we'll pass it over to Davisha. Hi everyone, good night. I'm Davisha, I'm from Dominica, and the aspect of geology and society that I'll be talking about tonight is based on something that I wrote for the Cary Sealand project, um, suggesting that we should work on setting up geoheritage sites on this island and using the Maroon Camp in Bells as an example. So the outline for um, this talk tonight, I'll define what geoheritage is. I will try my best to be brief with the geology of Dominica. I'll introduce the Maroons and how they use the landscape to their advantage, and then talk about a few other places where geology pops up in our culture every day, and then um, wrap up with some quick suggestions for geology and geoheritage for the future. So first, um, geoheritage um, geo is made up of geological features that were or currently are important to a community for economic, historic, cultural, or scientific reasons. Um, these could be mining sites, the location of a key event where the outcome was influenced by the environment, uh, specific places that feature heavily in folk stories and local legends, or unique research locations that contain ideal examples of fossils or landforms or et cetera. So the image shows an example of a well-known geoheritage site. It is Uluru in Australia. It's a sandstone rock, which rises really sharply um, around the surrounding flat topography. And it is sacred to the indigenous residents of this area, but also really interesting geologically. So to orient the audience uh, to the location of Dominica, it is at the eastern edge of the Caribbean Sea in the middle of the Lesser Antilles Island arc between Guadeloupe and Martinique. Dominica, uh, along with the rest of the Eastern Caribbean volcanic islands, formed from part of the South American plate that contains the Western Atlantic sinking underneath the Caribbean plate. As the sinking material melts, it rises back up towards the surface and um, rises through the overlying plate. And where it breaks through to the surface, uh, volcanoes are formed. And because it's coming up through ocean, in this case, it's forming new land and creates volcanic islands. So through this process, Dominica started forming about 26 million years ago, didn't really break the ocean surface until about 7 million years ago. Uh, most of the activity was between two to four million years with some activity in the last few thousand, last 25,000 years, but no major activity this century. So the landscape is mainly a result of volcanism, 
and the erosion and modification of volcanic processes um, through hydrology. We have many streams, uh, about 365 of them. I like to say there's one for every day of the year. And uh, there's a lot that I could say about the geology of Dominica. Um, for this presentation, you just need to understand that the type of volcanoes we have results in steep mountains, um, explosions that produce craters, major collapses and landslides. Um, these features are then filled in or softened by lava flows, mud flows, pyroclastic flows and ash. And all of that is carved out or scoured out by um, rivers, by water. We have nine active volcanic centers, not actively, not are presently erupting, just showing signs of life and two inactive centers. So all of this comes together in really dramatic topography with the relief rising from sea level to thousands of feet very, very rapidly. So this was really useful to the Maroons. For the Maroons, or the Negmawas they're called in Creole, are people who are escaping enslavement and attempting to free others from slavery and waging war on the plantation and colonial powers in Dominica in the 17 and 1800s. So the center of the island was dominated by mountains and settlements and plantations were restricted to the flatter areas along the coast. So that led to a really large area for the Maroons to seek refuge in the mountains. And the map on the right shows some Maroon camps, not all of them, but some Maroon camps clustered around volcanic centers in Dominica. So we have Farcel and Corbois camp in the north around Mont Diablote, which is the tallest mountain on the island. Um, Chief Jacko's camp, we'll talk about in a second, in between Mont Diablote and Mont Apito. And Mont Apito is the beautiful volcano that everybody saw on the um, intro video while we were waiting for the stream to go live. And there are other camps around the volcanoes in the south of the island. So the combination of deep canyons and steep hillsides and dense vegetation covering the mountains in the interior gave the Maroons who had um, a better understanding of the land and a better lay of the land an upper hand over the colonists who inhabited the flat areas along the coast. It allowed many independent communities of formerly enslaved people to thrive and sustain themselves in the hills for decades. Um, just longer than Maroon efforts on most other islands and second only to Maroon efforts in Haiti. And these were not the first or last people to seek refuge in these hills. But aside from being remote and uninhabited, what really made these mountains so useful? So how were they able to use the geology to their advantage? Uh, using the example of Jacko Steps, which is part of the community, which was led by Chief Jacko, one of the better known Maroon leaders, um, he set up camp at a very high elevation. It was remote and secure, and they had great views of anyone who was approaching from below. So that's what the photo on the right shows, um, looking down at the stream from above. You have a really clear um, view of anyone before they would have any idea that you are in the area. And they were close to a freshwater source filled with fish, the soil was great for farming and cultivating, and they hand carved extremely steep steps into the hard volcanic rocks um, that they could use and scramble up and down very quickly, but their enemies would struggle to climb. Um, the this picture doesn't really do it justice. These steps are incredibly, incredibly steep. Um, and this was the only way to access the camp. The cliffs themselves couldn't be scaled, and um, this provided another really good defense for this location. Additionally, if they were out and about when anyone came looking for them, there are lots of places to quickly duck into and hide. Uh, caves and grottos where they often left messages for each other when passing through a location. So I propose preserving and celebrating these sites and the features there, knowing how quickly geo and climate hazards can hide places away and also as a way of discouraging development that's destructive or makes them inaccessible to communities in the, in the immediate surroundings. Um, although some of the sites and um, other proposed geo-heritage sites 
are in protected forest areas, there isn't anything in place for this specific type of preservation. Um, a lot of them are on privately owned land. And in the case of Jacko Steps, there's an ongoing independent cultural preservation process at this location by the owners, which is great because this is a really important part of our history and culture and needs to be celebrated and commemorated and we don't really talk about it all that much. So we can look at how geology has been influential in the past, but also how it continues to shape the present and how things on this island were made easier or harder because of the way that the land formed. So the settlements and roads are still mainly coastal and that makes communities seem a lot further away from each other than they really are, especially before um, the major roads and um, highway networks were developed. And that allowed traditions and cultural practices to develop really unique flares um, in each village that was sort of tucked away. In the 60s and 70s, agriculture, specifically banana and citrus farming, was the mainstay of our economy and the soil quality was crucial to the success. It's very high quality because of the volcanic origin and it's rich in minerals that uh, gradually release over time. The soil has the perfect pH for banana and citrus crops and the shape of the grains balance um, water drainage and retention in a way that is again perfectly suited to what ended up being our cash, our cash crops. This was so important that the black stripe on our flag represents the fertility of the soil, as well as being a tribute to our African ancestors. Also, the white on the flag represents the rivers and water quality, and the green um, represents our rainforests. In fact, the themes of um, the shape of the land and the quality of the natural resources are so woven into our identity as a country that in addition to the flag, our national anthem is pretty much a love song to the landscape. Out of three verses, the first one and a half are dedicated to the land, um, talking about the mountains, the rivers, and the valleys specifically. And these are themes that continue to show up in art and literature and storytelling in Dominica. Speaking of storytelling, um, a specific kind of folklore features some creatures on the island that, like the Maroons, also depended on the environment um, or are its caretakers. So for example, Papa Bois, who is a steward of the mountain forest, and Mama Glow, a water spirit, are said to punish anyone who kills animals unnecessarily or pollutes rivers or damages the forest or otherwise causes destruction to the landscape. And they're said to inhabit the same areas that the Maroons did, the volcanoes and their foothills, which is really interesting to me and might become a project in its own right. So look out for that. Um, finally, we, uh, we can consider how geology and potential geoheritage sites could be useful in the future. So we know that the mountains have been a refuge and a source of safety, but they can also be deeply destructive because of their nature. And we've seen that in neighboring islands in the last few decades. and presently at St. Vincent with the ongoing eruption. So how can we build awareness of um, both sides of this nature and prepare for the inevitable? So I propose um, documenting the landscape as it exists at the moment before storms, landslides, floods, etc., come through and alter it further. Uh, this is not just specific to Dominica, it could also apply to other locations with um, existing or potential culturally significant geologic sites, uh, hosting events or designing signs for self-guided walks or tours could improve the knowledge of the general public of specific events and their influences. And these sites could also be used for education and research and teaching as outdoor classrooms or labs. And I think that would really encourage local work in STEM and the humanities and arts, all of which are equally important, and it would be a great opportunity to test methods that encourage us to respectfully and sustainably engage with the land, knowing that we're visitors to a site that may just end up being um, very impermanent, regardless of how much significance we gain from it. 
So my final point is that these mountains and their related features have been a respite for people, especially during the lockdowns and the pandemic. And that is just one last reminder that our environment can shape us through our recreation practices, our history, our cultural elements, and um, our day-to-day -day life, just as much as we end up shaping it through our land use processes and practices. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Davisha. Uh, we have a few questions for you. Um, the first one is about uh, the Maroons. How long did Maroon sites last um, and how long were Maroons present on Dominica? Uh, the Maroons on Dominica, I think uh, between 50 and 75 years um, before they were eventually defeated. How many of these camps or sites have you been to? I've only been to one that I'm aware of. Um, what are some other questions? Uh, are there evidence of messages at these sites? Uh, yes, I think there have been um, noted instances where shapes or symbols or otherwise carvings, messages were left. Um, but I cannot give you a specific example. <laughs> No worries. Um, do you have any other examples of other geo heritage sites? In around the world, in ones that I think would be cool to establish in Dominica or? Um, it doesn't matter what, whatever you want to okay. answer. Um, I think a really interesting site also in Dominica, because I guess that's just where my brain is at right now, would be um, La Scala Teche in the Northeast. Um, there's a really interesting creation story surrounding the feature. It's a basaltic dike and it looks like um, stairs coming up out of the ocean. Um, it also looks like a snake, snake's tail. Um, and there's a story about a snake, um, a Kalanago story about the snake coming from Guyana up the island chain, um, coming up out of the water onto the land and then further inland and that's how it formed. So I think that would be another good location to preserve because the geology is really closely related to the interest in the site. Cool. Um, we have a, a couple questions asking um, if you could repeat the name of the nature deity from the heritage lore. Papa Boa. Do you mind spelling and, it for people? <laughs> yes. Um, can I type it? Okay. Papa, like P A P A, and Boa, B O I S, or Boa, B W A. So there are two um, spellings that they may be able to use. Great. Christina, if you can type it in the chat for everyone. Um, uh, and the other um, the other nature spirit, sorry, is Mama Glow. Mm -hmm. So M A M A and D L O. Thanks, cool. Davisha. Um, just one more question. Uh, can you tell us more about potential volcanic hazards since you study volcanoes? Yeah, um, there are a lot. Uh, there are ash hazards and ash fall hazards, um, pyroclastic flows and pyroclastic density currents. So those are really fast moving um, slurries of superheated rock, boulders, gases that um, come down the mountainside and cover or carry away everything in their path. Um, Lahars, which are sort of like mud flows, but the muddy material is um, volcanic in nature. Uh, lava flows, which I think are the most common ones that everybody thinks of. Uh, molten material or molten rock um, moving down a mountainside. Uh, 
ballistics, which are projected or ejected fragments of rock. And yeah, I think those are the, those are the big ones. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Davisha, for joining us tonight. Um, we're gonna pass it over to Hendrada now. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, people of the interweb. Uh, thank you so much for having me tonight. So today I will talk about stress on estuary and mangroves. This is a really large topic, but I think um, I'll try to keep it down and narrow, just very broadly. So first, um, I would kind of describe what estuaries are. And the first stress, of course, is the number of cities that are on or near estuaries. Then we'll talk about the different types of estuaries, why they are so unique, um, the particular locations of estuaries that have mangroves, and why we should care. And the reason is basically these are areas that we've overworked. So the, the map that I have here um, shows a little bit of how an estuary might look like. And it is characterized by the inter interaction of water from the river, fresh water and salt water from the sea. And when these two mix, they form what we call brackish water. And brackish water is not quite salty like ocean water and it is not quite fresh like river water. But this combination gives this environment a very unique characteristic. And so it also has a unique ecosystem and that is what attracts a lot of attention. But the, the, the most salient thing about these environments is that because they are in an embayment, some kind like a kind of a nook along the coastline, they are really good areas where historically people have been attracted to. For the, for the first thing, they, in the past, they were ideal areas to have seaport for, for navigation. And so most of the cities in the world really, I think about 22 out of the 34 largest cities in the world are found on estuaries. And for you at home, if you wanted to check, you can just go, if you have Google Earth, you know, you can go and type in some of these cities and you'd see, um, Seattle, San Francisco, New Orleans, New York, London, Amsterdam, everywhere. Most of the big cities are all on estuaries. And these are not even all, all the 22 of the largest cities that are found on estuaries. So you can imagine that this environment have been attracting humans and accommodating humans for so long. So that's the first source of stress. We've just gone and settled these environments and we have so many people that are packed here. So that's the first thing I, I would encourage everybody. If you think you live around estuary, just go and check. What you'd notice if you look at these pictures carefully is that most of these areas have these little nooks where you have like the blue ocean water seems to be penetrating all over. And so these are the sheltered parts of the coastline that gives rise to estuaries. So there are several different types. So these areas are formed for different reasons. And here I kind of list um, the forming types of estuaries, but there are other types that we can continue to describe. If you're a geoscientist, you know, we love to categorize things and put things in groups. Um, the first one is the coastal plain estuary right here. And basically it's this little, um, looks like a funnel, a very long stretched funnel. And what um, is really unique about all of this, you'd notice is that there's, this, there's an opening that connects this little part to, to the ocean. And here this formed when rivers erode um, the coastline and if sea level rises, then the water floods that area and interacts with the river water and it forms these coastal plain estuaries. 
um, in San Francisco Bay is an example of what we call a tectonic estuary, which is where when earthquakes, for example, if earthquakes happen and land sinks, it creates a depression where seawater can then flood and interact with any water that's coming from the land. And so you'd have tectonic estuary. Um, and you know, these cartoons that they kind of do to show that the biggest thing to create an estuary and not something else is the fact that you have river water and ocean water that are mixing in that environment. Um, Barbelt estuaries. So these forms, especially where you have barrier islands, and these barrier islands could be created by coral reefs that grow out and separate the open ocean from, say, a lagoon. And in that process, they isolate the lagoon waters and create barriers so that not enough all the ocean water is flooding into that area. So you have like this little leaky portions between the bars of sand or coral, or carbonate rocks, whatever. And this creates um, basically barriers to, to the lagoon. And so that reduces the amount of ocean water that might flood that area. Um, this is the example in the Carolinas and Virginia um, in the East Coast. And then we have the fjord type estuary, which basically occurs when glaciers kind of created very deep, steep U-shaped valleys. And as the, the glacier melts or recedes, then ocean water can flood into that area again, interacting with the fresh water from the glacier melt. And so you'd have shared um, type estuaries. So in Seattle and the Northwest, you have this type of estuary. So basically across the US, you can find um, coastal plain, tectonics, barbell, fjord types, and deltaic estuaries, which we, we haven't even gone into. So there's other different types of estuaries. In fact, um, there are more than, according to the um, United States Environmental Protection Agency, there are more than 100 estuaries in the United States alone. So that's a lot. And, you probably find this a lot around the coastline, but also where you have large lakes like Great Lakes and um, other water bodies that do not have the same chemistry as rivers. So there's, the, there's I think there's a statistic that says every year, more than 70% of Americans go to an estuary, they visit an estuary. So it's, it's a lot of stress on a natural environment to have that many people coming to it all the time. And that's not all. People visit, but then most of the big cities are on estuaries, so people live there, people use the resources. So it, what I think has happened um, over time is that because we've settled these estuaries for so long, some don't even look like estuaries anymore, so people cannot even recognize them for what they are. And now we can begin to correlate or correspond them to other areas that have not been developed to that extent. And so for me, that's what is really fascinating and important to think about. So estuaries are, are unique because they are sheltered. And estuaries that are found specifically between the tropics of Cancer and the tropics of Capricorn, so around 30 degrees north and south of the equator, you have those estuaries typically are associated with forest, um, mangrove forest, which, are, which is a kind of vegetation that is uniquely adapted to survive and thrive in salt water. They're the only type of forest that grow in, in salt water and that thrives in that environment. So that's already very unique because you don't have other um, forest species that do that. But in addition to that, they, they create a very unique ecosystem because they are right at the boundary between land and ocean. And so you have the interaction of these two big environments that gives rise to this very biodiverse community. So it's biologically very diverse. It's a wonderful ecosystem. And this map that I have here just shows some of the different parts of the world 
where you have mangroves and you can see that most of the mangroves in the world are found in Southeast um, Asia at 5% and then you have 16 in South America, 15 in North and Central America, 13 in West and Central Africa and the remaining fraction is kind of scattered all over. But what is really frightening though is that the rate at which these are being destroyed is alarming because of course they are first in coastal cities so there's the competition for land for land reclamation to build homes to develop the coastline um, but also for shrimp farming aquaculture um, shrimp farming and other fisheries um, also for timber so logging they are being logged a lot for timber and just a lot of fishing, sand, mud for building. So these environments provide so much. And it is not new. It's not like these things started today. But what is different now is that we have the technology to exploit these environments faster than they are being um, re regenerated. So the reef vegetation is not as rapid as the... Uh, as the rate at which we are damaging. So it's really hard for the environment to keep up with what it is that we are, we are doing to it. But mostly um, for me, I think what seems to be even more alarming now is that the, the problem that the world is facing with litter, especially plastic is also um, happening to mangroves. Mangroves are, are, are really great because the way they grow and the way they develop along the shoreline, they've served in an important purpose of controlling and cleaning water. So river water that brings sediment, it filters the water and before it gets to the ocean, it is clean. It takes out the metals, it takes out the waste. It purifies the water before it goes to the ocean. But now these forests are also doing the job of purifying the water from all the other junk that we threw into it, these things that were not designed to go into the, into the coastal environment. So it's becoming really, really, um, really, really hard. So the reason why I think we should care about mangroves is first because the They provide services that we cannot replace, that we cannot substitute for. If, if you pay attention to the news, um, most of the time, for example, when you have hurricane, cyclone, um, rough weather seasons, especially along the coast, in areas that used to have mangroves or dense mangrove forests, these used to act as buffers and they could shield the coastline from these strong storms. Now, as they are being damaged and completely wiped out, we're more exposed to these strong ocean forces. Uh, the second thing is, I think about more than 70% of fisheries, fisheries depend on estuaries and the estuarine environment for for the fishing production if you if you will so mangroves serves and estuaries in general they are nurseries because they are calm the roots and the canopies provide basically a very snuggy environment for um, baby fish and birds, other types of wildlife to, to live. There's a lot of food because of what is being brought, the nutrients that are being brought in from the continent in rivers, but also what's being produced there by the micro primary producers, plankton, algae, and so forth. So there's enough food for sea dwelling organisms to use. So there are the nurseries of the world, basically. If you eat fish, you probably depend on estuaries and mangrove system that nurses them. They also guard the coastline. They guard the coastline against storms. They protect the 
shores from erosion. They anchor the whole the, the, the soil so that it doesn't get washed away that easily. And we talk about climate change, but for a long time, we did not realize how much mangroves and the mangrove ecosystem was important in capturing and storing carbon from the atmosphere. So if you think about it, they have forests, they have grass, but then they have sediment, so soil that the carbon can be stored in. There is the water that can dissolve the carbon, the carbon dioxide. So you have a combination of factors that really allow for carbon dioxide to be captured and sequestered. And if we are destroying this ecosystem, then we are releasing that carbon and it has to go somewhere. Either it goes back into the ocean and increases acidification or it goes back to the atmosphere and increases greenhouse gases. Then there is pollution, overfishing, logging, ever-growing human population. So we, we are asking so much from these environments and we are giving back so little that if we don't start as a um, human community to think about ways of managing, because we, we do it because we need this environment, but we don't want to love the environment to death, right? We have to make sure that we are doing it in a sustainable way, that we're giving it time to kind of recuperate before things get um, really, really serious. So basically, um, the, the last thing that I want to leave you with is that because of their unique situation at the boundary of land and the ocean, we have an intersection of all the different forces of nature, you know, the atmosphere, the biological community, the, the, the water and the sediment and rocks. And so this interaction creates a very unique ecosystem that for, for millennia, for a very long time, we've been using and not really noticing because it does the busy work of trying to keep us, keep us alive. So if we do not, I guess my call is that we should, everybody should kind of stop and think about how much we're tasking this communities. The, some have been transformed to the point that we can no more roll back, but maybe there's a way to prevent those that have not been transformed in that way to survive and thrive. And I'm thinking of some of the big cities that do not look anything like coastal environment because they've been completely altered. So um, that's what I would leave you all with. If you have some questions for me, I would be happy to answer them. I could talk about these environments for, for forever, but yeah, I think um, my time is up. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Andrada. Um, yeah, we have a bunch of questions. Um, oh my so. goodness, people of the interweb. <laughs> Yeah, these are great people of the interweb. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much. Um, first question that we got in was, um, how are invasive species impacting estuaries resiliency? Invasive species, um, yeah. for the most part, the, 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 the Australian community itself manages differently. And mm -hmm. I think one of the ways that I always look at um, these thoughts is we are the people who worry about invasive species because of the services that we take from this environment. The way the world nature works is that all environments were invaded at some point by some species, right? So. Mm -hmm. When we talk of in, in invasive species, it's more in terms of how they are impeding our own experience with the environment. Mm. And, and I think that in that sense, 
we have to, it's hard to prevent because of global trade. I, I'm thinking of muscles um, and I'm, I'm not a biology person yeah. per se, but I know that those creatures, they hang on vessels and they go all over the world and they invade mm -hmm. territories and waters that were not meant for them and they can proliferate because there's food. So again, it comes, it comes back to um, this idea of there's one ocean and that ocean is endless. And we cannot look at oceans the way we look at national boundaries or the way we look at um, state boundaries or the way we look at county boundaries. Yeah. The ocean is, is an expanse, it's continuous. And what you do in one corner can significantly affect something elsewhere. And if we don't stop thinking about it at, as isolated parts, when we say Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, we are putting imaginary boundaries but the reality is that water just goes all over the place. So to, to that point, I think it's, it's not really an easy thing to control the, the impact of invasive species because the global community has yet to, to figure out how to work together to, mm -hmm. to resolve some of this problem. By the way, um, the yeah, UNESCO has been trying to push for um, Remembrance Day, Celebration Days to kind of celebrate some of these, um, mm -hmm. this environment so that we take a break and think about what we're doing to them. So I can't really speak to specific invasion in invasive mm -hmm. species, but generally I can say that they, they are a problem and also the trade. You know how we, we like to trade in exotic yeah. critters, whatever they are. That's another yeah. thing that is really causing a problem because we're moving them from one community and taking them to different communities. It's, it's just a complicated web. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people are curious because, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, geology, you just look at rocks. So you're, you know, studying mangrove estuary seems like this mix between like, ecology and biology and botany and so what is your role specifically when you go out into the field um to study these environments as a that's, that's a good question so my 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 focus i'm a water water is the first thing that i'm interested in but i cannot really understand what's going on in the water if i don't look at what's happening with the sediment and what's mm -hmm. happening with the vegetation and all the other systems that are interacting with the water. So I have to pay some attention if I want to have a good picture of what's going on. So going into estuaries, I was primarily interested in looking at carbon and how mm. carbon is moving in the water. But then I realized, well, you can't really look at carbon without paying attention to the vegetation or thinking about the sediment and looking at how it is moving in and out of that system. So I became interested in mangroves and began to discover how awesome these forests are. And I'm thinking, I should have changed my discipline and, uh, yeah. and yeah, you know? <laughs> so yes, if you are interested in plants, these this are awesome systems to learn. Yeah, great. Um, and then I think we have time for a couple more. Um, oh, so you know, you're talking about how these huge cities are next to estuaries. Um, are there still places where there are pristine mangrove estuaries in the world? Um, I think there are some, so these can be really big. So the estuary that I study are in mm -hmm. the Atlantic coast of Africa, um, in Cameroon. And there are parts when you go further towards as you go further and further towards the ocean, mm -hmm. they are almost pristine, but they are no longer because when you have when you have seaport and oh plastics, plastics are all over the place. Even if you go to the parts that are not inhabited by any person, you will mm -hmm. see that little plastic bottle floating around. Yeah plastic bags and so on. So it's it's becoming more and more difficult to find areas that are pristine, but you can still find areas that have not been 
exploited a lot. Mm. But yeah. because of the pressure of land reclamation, people are going into these areas more and more. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yes, in, in, in some parts of um, the on, um, developing nations, you may find areas that have not been um, exploited that much. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, about mangrove forest being such valuable um, carbon storage, you know, people mostly think of rainforests as being like the big carbon storage of our planet. So how, how do mangrove estuaries compare to rainforests and like how much carbon they store? Oh my goodness, it's still about four times more. It's they still a, way more than we used to think. And, mm -hmm. and that's because when you think of the rainforest, the one way to look at it is the rainforest is on land and it's storing most of the carbon in the leaves of the, in the vegetation and maybe the mm -hmm. soil. When you are in the mangrove, it's, it's in water. So storing the, 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 the carbon in the trees and the leaves, but then there's also the soil that it is in. There's also the water because water dissolves carbon dioxide. So you have this combination of things that are capturing the, the, the carbon. And because it's a water environment, you can also convert that carbon dioxide into mineral like calcite. So it's, 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 it's a very unique. In fact, something that I did not mention is that mangroves are usually adjacent to coral reefs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Think about it. They clean all this water, and so the coral reefs have a clean environment to grow. So it's a symbiotic relationship that works great. Mm -hmm. So these these estuaries can really capture way more than we we used to think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they capture way more, even though they are a very small part of the global forest. They capture a lot more carbon than um, that environment yeah yeah that's so interesting um thank you so much um for being with us here tonight um yeah everyone pay attention to your to your local estuaries mangrove <laughs> estuaries yeah thank thank you people of the interweb it was <laughs> talking to you bye bye um and next up we have dr justin rubenstein from the usgs Okay, so this evening I'll be talking about uh, induced earthquakes in the central U.S. And what I mean by induced earthquakes are earthquakes that humans are causing. And as you might guess from this picture, uh, it's the oil and gas industry that's causing most of these earthquakes. What you might not guess is that these earthquakes are primarily not caused by hydraulic fracturing. They're actually caused by a process caused uh, called wastewater disposal. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And as you might guess from the other picture here, Oklahoma really is the epicenter of this problem, uh, especially a number of years ago. Now, induced earthquakes are not actually a new phenomenon. They've gone back to over, oh, go, gone back over a hundred years to the late 1800s when mining was causing earthquakes in the city of Johannesburg in South Africa. But induced earthquakes have become a much bigger issue here in the United States since about 2009, when earthquakes started occurring primarily in Oklahoma. So what we're looking at here is a count of magnitude three earthquakes in the central United States going back to the early 1970s. And you can see up until about 2009 or so, the earthquake rate was sort of rattling on somewhere around 20 or 30 magnitude three earthquakes per year. Since then, the earthquake rate has dramatically accelerated, reaching a maximum of over 1,000 magnitude three or larger earthquakes in 2015. The earthquake rate has declined, but you can see this red X here is actually a projection for this year, and you can see we're starting to turn upwards. Now, I should say the reason that I'm looking at magnitude three earthquakes and larger is that we're confident that we're not missing any earthquakes. Of course, our abilities to detect earthquakes have improved with improved processing techniques and the addition of more seismometers, but even prior to this increase, 
we are confident that we recorded all of these earthquakes. So this is a real signal that we're seeing and not actually just an artifact of our, our abilities to see these earthquakes. So this is a real dramatic signal here, an increase of, of almost 50 times the, or the natural background rate in 2015. And it's not just the numbers of these earthquakes that has changed, it's the distribution of these earthquakes. So here we're looking at 35 years of natural seismicity uh, up to 2008. And you can see the earthquakes are sort of spread around the central US, sort of like a shotgun blast. You can see there are concentrations of seismicity right here. And this is known as the New Madrid seismic zone. And then again, here in Eastern Tennessee is known as the Eastern Tennessee shear zone. Both of these are areas of known natural seismicity. Now, the next slide that I'm going to show you is the recent, the past 12 years of seismicity. And if you didn't know better, you would expect that there are far fewer earthquakes on it. But there are actually more than three times as many earthquakes on this slide. It's just that they're almost entirely concentrated right here in Oklahoma. And so you can see that this is, is much more concentrated. There are a number of areas, but in particular Oklahoma, where there's really dense populations of these earthquakes. So let's, uh, another way to sort of think about the distribution of these earthquakes is, is to look at a cumulative count of earthquakes. So instead of, of looking at in an annual perspective, here we're just summing up all the earthquakes. And so if there was a, a background rate, a constant rate of earthquakes, you'd expect this to just be a line. And you can see from 1995 to 2010, it is more or less a line. And then it starts departing upwards. So what I'm gonna do in the next few slides is show you how we can just subtract out a few different areas and get back to this flat line. So let's first eliminate Oklahoma. Uh, like I said, this is the biggest problem. Well, we take away Oklahoma and the problem is almost gone already. And this is an area of known induced earthquakes. We can then subtract the Raton Basin in Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico, and the line flattens out further. We can subtract out the Guy Greenbrier earthquake sequence in central Arkansas, and it flattens out early, uh, even further. But you still know with all of these, there is sort of this upward trend. There appears to be an increasing earthquake rate just in the last few years. And so that goes away when we subtract out Texas, and in particular, the Permian Basin area right here, where seismicity has really accelerated just in the last two years. And you can see now, we're more or less back to a flat line. And so what this really tells us is that the natural seismicity rate really hasn't changed. It's just in these areas of induced seismicity that the, the massive increase in earthquakes is occurring. And it, one thing that's really impressive about this is that the earthquake crisis in Oklahoma was so bad that the earthquake rate in Oklahoma was higher than that of California for four years. So again, we're looking at a count of magnitude three earthquakes, shown in blue is California, shown in red is Oklahoma. And you can see California sort of rattles along somewhere between two and 400 magnitude threes per year, but there's a few spikes. And those go along with large earthquakes that occurred in California, and more specifically, the very active aftershock sequences, the most recent being the Ridgecrest earthquake that happened in the Mojave Desert uh, two years ago on the 4th of July weekend. Now you can see prior to 2009, the Oklahoma line is more or less indistinguishable from zero, but it starts creeping upwards and from 2014 to 2017, the earthquake rate in Oklahoma exceeded that in California. It has since dropped down. This is a projection for 2021. The earthquake rate is still dramatically going down, but it's still much higher than the natural background rate of seismicity. So I think the best way to really uh, exemplify this, uh, the best way we're gonna really see the dramatic change in the earthquake rate is this animation here. So you're gonna see uh, earthquakes popping up as these symbols, and you're also gonna hear sounds going along with them. Things are gonna start off slow. You'll see seismicity primarily here in central Oklahoma, but it's gonna move further north towards the Kansas border. And I'm gonna let you just listen to hear the, the earthquake rate change.
So I think that really puts in perspective what a dramatic change in the earthquake rate and what life was like in Oklahoma in 2014, 2015, 2016. They were averaging two or three magnitude three earthquakes per day in the state. And uh, really, really was quite, quite impactful on the, on the people of the state. And it wasn't just magnitude threes. There were a number of damaging earthquakes. In 2016 alone, there were three magnitude five or larger earthquakes. First in January, there was the Fairview earthquake. It caused a little bit of damage, uh, not too much, only a 5.1. Then there was a Pawnee earthquake. This is the biggest injection-induced earthquake ever in the world. It's a magnitude 5.8 earthquake, again, caused some damage. And that was in September. And then, in fact, the most damaging earthquake was the magnitude five Cushing earthquake. And this is something important to take away uh, just in general about earthquakes is that proximity matters. Now the Pawnee and Fairview earthquakes were pretty remote. They were far away from, from cities and towns, whereas the Cushing earthquake was more or less in the city of Cushing and it caused pretty extensive damage to the historic downtown despite the fact it was a significantly smaller earthquake. So how close you are to these earthquakes really matters. So what is it that is causing these earthquakes? As I alluded before, it's oil and gas operations, and it is the injection of fluids from oil and gas operations, but it's really not hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing is responsible for somewhere between two and 3% of the induced earthquakes that are being experienced in the United States right now. And the biggest earthquake that we know of to have occurred in the United States caused by hydraulic fracturing was a magnitude four. Wastewater disposal, on the other hand, is responsible for the rest of the induced earthquakes that we're experiencing in the United States in Oklahoma and Texas in particular. And it's caused all of the big ones. So including the Pawnee earthquake, the magnitude 5.8 earthquake. And so wastewater disposal is exactly what it sounds like. It's injecting waste fluids from the oil and gas process deep underground. So it's similar to hydraulic fracturing, but it's going to be at much higher volumes and lasting for much, much longer. Hydraulic fracturing is typically a very brief process lasting hours or days, and the volumes are going to be, as you might expect, significantly smaller than wastewater disposal. So how is it that injection causes earthquakes? So we're gonna walk through an animation here and you can see we've got an injection well here and it's going to inject into this formation. And this formation is going to be fractured just so the fluids can flow in easily. You can see our fault right here and this fault is being held closed by the natural stress. Now the fluid is gonna flow outward away from our well and eventually it's going to penetrate the fault. And it's when the fluid reaches into the fault, it's going to start prying it open a little bit. And as you pry it open, you reduce the frictional resistance to slip. And eventually what will actually happen is you've made it easier and easier for these earthquakes to happen. And eventually you're going to get an earthquake. Now, another way to think about this is if you remember in the before times when you could go to the mini golf place and go mini golfing or play foosball, you could also play air hockey, and air hockey is a pretty much a perfect analog for this. Now, the puck doesn't move very easily when the air is off, but when the air is turned on, the puck moves very, very easily. And that's exactly what is happening here. When you inject fluids and it gets into the fault, it's just like turning the air on on an air hockey table. So I just wanna briefly show uh, another example of how it is wastewater disposal and not hydraulic fracturing. Now, as I mentioned, hydraulic fracturing is a very brief process. And so we'd expect if it was going to induce earthquakes, it'd be more or less a one-to-one -one process in time. And so we're looking at eight years of, of earthquakes shown in black in Oklahoma and then fracks that occurred in Oklahoma shown in red. And you can see these really, they've, they've maybe heard of each other but there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation. And that's really what we would expect if fracking was responsible for these earthquakes. So fracking again can be ruled out for being responsible for the lion's share of these earthquakes. 
Now, if we look at this plot of wastewater disposal, so shown in blue is the total injection rate in central Oklahoma and shown in black as a count of earthquakes. You can see the earthquakes start turning on when the, when the fluid injection reaches a level of about 5 million barrels per month, uh, or five, 5 million cubic meters per month, excuse me. And you can see that these correlate pretty well. There is a little bit of delay with the earthquakes with respect to the injection, but we don't necessarily expect there to be a one-to-one -one connection. The fluids that are going in in wastewater disposal are much, much higher volume, and they are going to last, stay around a lot longer and have the opportunity to cause earthquakes for much more time than fracks. Now, as you might guess, uh, this is a really fraught issue. Uh, oil and gas represents a very important industry in a number of these states, in particular, Oklahoma and Texas. And it really has led to uh, reticence uh, of, of regulators and politicians to, to do something to try to slow down these earthquakes, as you see by some of these headlines. But eventually, in, in March of 2015, the state of Oklahoma implemented some regulations to, to try to slow down or stop these induced earthquakes. Now, the most obvious thing that they could do, and they did do, was to reduce the total injected volume. As you saw, the more you inject, the more you cause earthquakes. So that was the first thing. And the second thing they did is to start injecting in formations further above the earthquakes. Whereas before the injection was very, very close to where the earthquakes were, the regulators told them they had to pull away. And you can see that it appears that the regulations did have something, it did have an effect. So here's a count in gray showing you the count of magnitude threes per month in Oklahoma. And this shaded area is when injection in the state of Oklahoma has been regulated. So it does appear that there has been an effect, but it's not quite so simple. This also corresponds in time with a dramatic drop in the price of oil. So in early 2014, the price of oil was over $100 a barrel. By the end of 2014, it was under about $40 a barrel. So there was much less economic incentive for the oil and gas industry to produce. And therefore, they would be, by producing less, they're having less to inject. So what is the outlook? First off, it's, it's clear these regulatory actions work. The earthquake rate in Oklahoma has dropped precipitously and it's been, and regulations have been implemented in a number of cities to specifically reduce earthquakes caused by individual wells. And these are just some examples. The EPA has also released guidance for oil and gas operators to try to reduce these earthquakes. And seven different states have implemented their own induced seismicity regulations. So we are moving in the right direction. And so I'll just leave you, if you're interested in uh, learning more about induced earthquakes, there's a plain English article about uh, induced earthquakes that's available on our induced earthquakes webpage. And also there's, here's a couple of long form articles that I think are really good about the induced earthquake problem. They're both get into the science of the induced earthquakes, but also really the social issues. As I, as I alluded to, there really has been uh, a, a lot of, of politics, a lot of wrangling, there's, there's some intrigue, there's lawsuits going on here that, that I really didn't have the time to go through, but I, I definitely recommend taking a look at, at some of those articles. And uh, from there, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Hi, Justin. Hi. Um, I'm like still processing that video. Um, <laughs> it's overwhelming. It's, I've, I've, I've seen it dozens it's of times. It's a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because we did it during Tech Tech and without the context, it, it doesn't have the same impact. Um, so watching it again was a little crazy, um, but let's get into some questions. Um, sure, sure. Okay, let's see. Uh, first one is just that, I mean, I don't know. Um, if this relates, but um, number of fault lines in Oklahoma versus in California? Sure, that's a great question. Yeah, you might expect that there aren't many faults in Oklahoma, but yeah. basically everywhere in the world is is littered with faults. They're just not necessarily active. You know, everywhere on the earth at one point had active faults. And so uh, there, there are um, 
for many, many faults in Oklahoma. It's just they're not normally active. Mm, that makes sense. Um, I can see if I can dig up a, a slide that shows that. Oh, here we go. If I can share my screen. So in the lower right, you can see uh, a map of, of the known faults in Oklahoma. So you can see there's lots. There's a lot. Yeah. Um, next question. Can you clarify the difference between wastewater injection and fracking? It sounds like a renaming. No, no, they're very different processes. So hydraulic fracturing is the short-term injection of water at very high pressure over, over hours or days to fr intentionally fracture rock so you can extract oil and gas. Basically, you frack a well, you withdraw that water, and then you start stuck sucking oil and gas out of it. Wastewater disposal is a very different process. So there you have a purpose drilled well just for an injection. And you've drilled this well typically much deeper than your production formation. And you're going to be injecting wastewater. And so what wastewater is, is primarily what's called produced water. And produced water is water that just comes up with the oil and gas that you're extracting. Um, oil is more or less the decomposed biological components of relict oceans. And so as you might expect, if you're extracting a relict ocean, in addition to the oil, you're going to get salt water. And so this occurs in, in all oil and gas reservoirs, not just reservoirs that have been fracked. So it's, they're very different processes. They're both injection of fluids, but, but, but they're not the same. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question on the process that generates wastewater, which you just mentioned, but is there other ways to deal with wastewater? Uh, it's a good question. The, the short answer is really no. Um, they, the amount of fluid that is being produced is, is unbelievable. Um, for, for the beer drinkers in, in the virtual room, there are two kegs to a barrel. And in Oklahoma, I think they injected in 2015, maybe a hundred million barrels. It's a lot of water. So there, there's, so just from a practicality, you can't do it. it the, the, it would be desirable to, to try to clean it. But right now, I think that the technology, the water there is very, very salty. It's uh, about 100,000 parts per million uh, dissolved solids. So three or four times saltier than ocean water. And right now it costs about $100 a barrel of salt water to make it clean. So, so it could be, you know, disposed into a river. So it's just, it's not financially viable for, for the oil and gas industry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm liking your analogies, by the way, with air hockey and Thanks. spears. Thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, so someone was talking about the, the fracking patterns that you had showed on one of the charts. Um, they say that the fracking pattern looks quite similar to the earthquake pattern, uh, but that the earthquake lags a bit, um, but seems That's to mirror right. the fracking. Yeah, it, it it looks like it's connected, but the but the thing is, is with frac induced earthquakes in general, basically, if a frac is going to induce earthquakes, it's happening within a few days of the fracking occurring, and and the lag that you saw on that figure is a year, two years, and that's just not realistic. So yeah, it look it's suggestive. It's 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 a bit of a misleading figure, but they, they're they're not related. I mean, there are definitely cases where it's very clear and that, mm -hmm. that, that fracking is causing earthquakes. And parts of Oklahoma, basically all the earthquakes are caused by fracking, but 98% you know, of the earthquakes in Oklahoma are actually caused by wastewater disposal. Um, once the wastewater induces the quake and activates the fault, does the water remain? And if it doesn't, does the fault remain active? So the, so the water stays, uh, the water, the water's not really going to go anywhere. And so this is, this is actually one, one thing that's, that's difficult with induced seismicity is that just by turning off the well, let's say you just want to stop injection so you can stop the earthquakes. Most mm -hmm. of the time that works pretty well. Your earthquakes will stop, you know, within a few months, but, but actually the first documented case of injection induced seismicity uh, goes back to the 1960s in the Rocky Mountain Arsenal outside of Denver. And we saw earthquakes persisting 10 or 15 years after they stopped injection. So 
Wow. So turning turning off the injection isn't necessarily a magic bullet. Um, and last question, are there other states taking note of what happened in Oklahoma? Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, there, there are seven states that have explicit regulations to, to try to minimize uh, induced seismicity. The state of New Mexico, it's not codified, but they are also uh, taking action to, to try to reduce induced seismicity or prevent induced seismicity. So, so there's, there's a number of states that are working on it. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the real question is, you know, this, this is probably going to keep happening uh, unless we seek alternate energy sources. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Justin. It was great having you uh, present, still processing the video. Um, I'll probably watch it again. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. Sure thing. Bring Christina back up. Hi. Yeah. Um, just so um, everyone. I was gonna say, just so everyone knows, um, Justin uh, suggested a few articles to to read if you if you want to read more. Um, I'm linking a couple of those in the comments. So, just so you know. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in tonight, and as always, special thank you to our presenters, um, Davisha, Hendrada, Justin. We loved having you on with us today. Um, next week, uh, for those of you who um, caught our extreme science night school last month, two months ago, I don't remember. Um, but in the past couple of months, we are doing a sequel of sorts. Uh, next week, we are doing extreme life. Um, so you'll meet uh, the world's most poisonous bird, um, hear about frogs that freeze every winter, uh, tiny thermophiles and other living organisms that have adapted and thrive um, through extreme measures and in extreme environments. Um, so tune in next week if you wanna learn about some extreme life. Um, also, we are gonna be sharing some exciting nightlife news on Tuesday. Um, so check out our website, sign up for our emails, follow us on social if you wanna hear some exciting news. Um, otherwise, Christine and I will announce it next week, but if you wanna hear it a couple days before, look for it on Tuesday. But yes, if you want to hear it from us, just tune in next week. Um, yeah. The best way to hear the news, right? Um, yeah, so subscribe to our YouTube channel um, so you never miss a night school. And um, if you're in the Bay Area, come see us at the Academy because we're back open again. Um, we're still relying on super generous support to keep going after basically a year of closure. So if you have been enjoying these programs and you're able to, there's a link in the YouTube description um, for how you can contribute to our Resilience Fund. And thank you so, so much. I know a lot of you watching have contributed. I just want to say thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks.